Hi, I'd like to welcome you to our uh, HSI Knowledge Broadcast Series. Today is March 30th. My name is Debbie Burdich, and I'm here to introduce a little bit about the topic of um, ISS medical operations. Next chart, please. Um, human systems integration is all about considering the human as part of the system and total system performance. And when you're considering human performance, uh, planning and implementing throughout the life cycle is key. Um, careful consideration should be given to the design development, design and development for uh, human capability and limitation so that you understand what humans can and can't do and what they do and don't need uh, to enable mission success. And that should be not only at the system, the mission level, the system level, subsystem level, but down to all of the hardware and the interfaces that, and software as well that the crew or the liveware, some people term them, uh, will touch and will use and will need to enable that mission success and to keep, the, keep themselves safe. Um, you also have to take into account the procedures for how this I equipment or the systems are going to be implemented and implementation strategies uh, during operations. And when I talk about implementation strategy, I mean not only for when it's a good day, but also when it's a bad day and what you're counting on to go right goes wrong. You have to have uh, plans in place for how you can support the crew to, again, enable mission and keep them safe uh, when things go right and when things don't go the way that, that you planned. Um, you also have to take into consideration training and, um, and also what I would call workforce education so that you're training your crew and the folks that support your crew on how they can enable mission success, what they can do to have them to understand how things are supposed to work, how the uh, humans are supposed to interact with that equipment or software to make it work, and um, to make sure that your workforce that's enabling that is educated as well so that when the time comes for them to speak up and provide the much needed input, um, they can do that and they feel comfortable doing that. Next chart, please. And so using an integrated team is really one way to contribute to the mission success and to stakeholder satisfaction. Um, when you, uh, I'm going to be uh, introducing uh, Rob Genet and um, Veronica Sabatier who lead this ISS um, mission team, operations team, and they really are that. They are the, they're team leads. and, and you know, comes to mind just like we just, uh, people probably watch the NCAA tournaments over the weekend. Um, you know, when you're trying to win a game, uh, being a team player is key. And for a coach, you have to make sure that everybody knows what the plays are, what someone does in case uh, something doesn't go right, how you can switch over to do something different if it's not working. It's uh, very important to be a team. And sure, in some cases, if you have one person who performs really well, it can compensate for a uh, lack of planning or for lack of team cohesiveness, but it won't get you there all the way and it only works part of the time. So if you're looking at really um, having everybody move in one direction and doing the right thing, uh, playing as a team is key. With HSI, uh, or human systems integration, when you're considering human health and performance and you're considering how you can keep the crew safe, how you can uh, improve on mission success, and how you can keep the crew, um, or and ha how you can have Im improved performance um, and reduce cost, you shouldn't start thinking of how the humans are going to interact with the system once your system is built and you've thrown the people in there. So you shouldn't start thinking of it at operations. You also shouldn't stop thinking of it just because, oh, we've built this vehicle and we're um, sending folks into space. Well, now your operations begins and your planning for the human is even more critical. And so that early deliberation really can enable mission success and that integrated effort is a big payoff. Um, 
with that, I'd like to go ahead and, re and uh, introduce uh, Rob Genet, who's going to get us started and talk about what this ISS Medical Operations Team does and why it's so important to enable mission success. Thank you, Debbie. Um, my name is Rob Janae, and I'm the section manager of medical operations uh, at Wiley. Um, and today I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, medical operations support uh, for ISS operations, uh, more specifically the role of the BME operations team lead uh, and their uh, responsibility to uh, help maintain crew, uh, crew procedures on board as well as other operational products. Uh, together, uh, myself and Veronica Sabache um, will cover uh, uh, from uh, I'll start out uh, giving you a, a, a high-level uh, understanding of what our operations teams and the operations teams le team leads do, uh, and Veronica will then go into more detail about the day-to-day -day operations of the operations team lead. Thanks. <clears throat> so uh, our, um, our medical operations team uh, consists of our, our group of flight surgeons, our BME flight controllers, um, and then a third ent entity, which is our BME operations team leads. And together, they have a very unique uh, responsibility to each flight, uh, flight con uh, I'm sorry, to each uh, uh, onboard crew in that um, they are there to assist uh, and ensure that we maintain crew health and safety throughout all phases of flight. <coughs> now, um, our staff provides uh, crew health monitoring and support uh, of each space flight crew um, and that includes both the development of medical requirements as well as the enforcement of medical requirements through various means, whether that be at control panels, uh, control boards, um, through gr the development of ground rules and constraints and flight rules, uh, as well as uh, real-time negotiation and mission control. Uh, in addition, our staff uh, provides uh, real-time monitoring of the crew health care system through flight control operations, um, we also provide the console references for the flight controllers for the crew health care system. Um, we develop all the crew procedures. Um, and then we also tr uh, do pre-flight training for our flight crews as well as our flight controllers. Um, now this uh, presentation is going to concentrate on the role of our BME operations team leads uh, and how they pull um, uh, references and, and pull people together from all areas of our directorate as well as the center uh, to develop uh, operational products for the crew healthcare system. Um, so they will serve, they serve as the integration function not only across the whole directorate for the crew healthcare system, but also across the whole JSC center. Next, please. Next slide. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> so our operations team leads are responsible for the multitude of integration tasks that need to take place for each checks device. Um, so uh, this enables us uh, to have a continuous support of each onboard device uh, for the crew healthcare system. Um, each of these tasks is vital for the successful on-orbit on operation uh, of each uh, checks device. Uh, crew healthcare system is often referred to as checks, and so you may hear us refer to that uh, throughout the presentation. Um, back in the late 90s, when we were developing uh, the crew procedures for checks for the first ISS crew, um, it was evident that we, there was a lack of integration across all stakeholders for the crew health care system. Um, so we developed the operations team lead positions within medical operations to help serve that bridge, to serve as that bridge um, to uh, get the inputs from all of our stakeholders within each checks discipline uh, to address all of their inputs and then to uh, final, once we come up with an internal uh, set of procedures, we then go ahead and finalize those procedures with a member of the astronaut corps. And when we uh, assign our operations team leads, we assign them uh, by one of our three subsystems within checks, whether that be environmental health system, uh, the countermeasure system, or the health maintenance system. So it, within medical operations, we have a prime operations team lead for each onboard checks device, as well as a backup operations team lead in the event um, that uh, we need extra support. <clears throat> so as you can see from the slide, we have over 40 onboard devices for the crew healthcare system. And all of these onboard devices have a wide range of function. So some of our devices deal with health maintenance, 
and, and crew health monitoring such as defibrillators. Um, we have onboard respiratory support packs. We have ultrasound. We also have medical kits for both ambulatory care and emergency medical care. Um, this ranging to environmental monitoring equipment where we have to monitor radiation, uh, on, or on orbit air quality, uh, water quality, acoustics, um, as well as uh, microbial growth within the station. And that ranging to our onboard exercise uh, countermeasures hardware. We have two treadmills, the Tevis and the Treadmill 2. Um, we have a cycle ergometer. Uh, we have a, a resistive exercise device. And then we have several uh, pieces of hardware that are used for biomedical monitoring uh, while we're using those devices to allow our flight surgeon team to analyze the crew's health throughout all phases of space flight. Next slide, please. So who do we integrate with? Um, our team, like I had mentioned earlier, our team integrates across the whole Space Science, Life Sciences Directorate as well as individuals outside of Space Science, Life Sciences and uh, several individuals throughout the center. So we integrate with the hardware providers from engineering so that we can develop our, our uh, we take their standard operating procedures and turn them into crew procedures. Um, we interface with the science disciplines and laboratories uh, over uh, in the environmental uh, monitoring areas and the countermeasures areas. Um, our flight surgeon office provides input for all of our medical procedures. Um, our pharmacy here at JSC helps us pack our medical kits. Um, we ensure that our crew procedures are in line with how we're training the crews um, to perform each of these uh, onboard operations. Our crew office is there to validate all of our procedures. Our flight control team integrates across MOD, um, specifically where we kind of uh, share um, uh, certain interests, such as ECLIS for environmental monitoring and the OSO flight controllers for uh, some of the on-orbit in-flight maintenance uh, activities that we need to perform. Um, our human factors uh, group helps us with habitability within uh, the you know, volumes within each module. Um, our astronaut strength conditioning and rehabilitation specialists help develop our uh, help us when we develop our exercise protocols for each one of the crews. Uh, we use our space medicine advanced projects team to help us look at next generation advancements for all of our crew healthcare system hardware. We, uh, the payloads community uses some of our hardware to perform some of their science. Uh, and then we use the logistics and maintenance group to help us ma maintain uh, or keep track of where our hardware is on board as well as uh, identify, uh, help us keep track of all our consumables that we use for each one of our devices. Next slide. So with that, <clears throat> I would like to introduce Veronica Savache. Veronica is uh, our technical lead for all of our op uh, BME operations team leads. Um, so I've kind of covered a high level overview uh, of of what an operations team we, team is and what the operations team job is. And Veronica is going to get more into the day-to-day -day activities uh, and logistics that the operations team lead uh, team uh, operations team lead perform. Okay, as Rob mentioned, my name is Veronica Sabache. I am the lead for the operations team members. Um, so we have about, we have exactly nine people um, for operations team. They're listed here. As he mentioned, they're organized by subsystem. So HMS, CMS, and EHS. For our HMS operations team leads, we have Linda Nieswich um, and Kathy Pierpoling. Those two, um, if you remember the previous chart, there's a list of HMS hardware. Between those two, those, those pieces of hardware are divided between them. And one serves as prime, the other serves as backup. For CMS, we have Daniil Conley, Linda Nieswich, uh, Carly Toder, Iona Gibson, and Austin Perk. Um, between CMS, Linda, I forgot to mention that Linda is split. We try to organize people um, within one subsystem. We do have one person that is split between HMS and CMS. Um, so she has the uh, very tough job. So um, for CMS, Daniil does Sevis. Uh, she's the lead for Sevis. Carly is the backup for Tevis, Treadmill 2, and um, also A-Red. Iona Gibson is the lead for Treadmill 2, and Austin is the lead for A-Red. For EHS, we have Kenny Ballard. We have Will Nysik and Cindy Wu. 
Uh, Kenny does the, most of the acoustics. Will takes care of our um, monitoring of um, CSACP, CDM, and our radiation hardware. Cindy Wu is mostly water quality, and she's backup for acoustics. And again, within that, those that's what their lead responsibilities are, but they're backup for each other. So for HMS, CMS, and EHS, Kenny would be the lead, for example, with EHS if both went Cindy and Will were absent. So that's how it's structured. Um, we also have additional projects. Not only are we responsible for the over 40 pieces of hardware, we also have other projects of, such as operations nomenclature. Um, we have a lead for that, who is Linda Nieswich. We have a MedOps book manager. My name is listed there now, but it's only temporary. Um, we have a medical checklist book manager. Um, that's Kathy Pierpoline. Um, we are also responsible for OCADS. That's something I'll be handing off as well. And, and sometimes we, ha we get what we call the SDTOs, and we also support those in a lead capacity. Um, our work that we do for SDTOs is not as much as we do for the lead checks hardware. Um, however, we still support it and make sure the implementation of those um, activities um, get done. Uh, and that's Daniil Conley for the Harness SDTO and Kenny Ballard for the uh, Colorimetric Water Quality Monitoring Kit and also the Air Quality Monitor, which is sometimes called GCDMS. Um, there is also another uh, person within our group, Will Meisig, who takes care of EHS integration tasks. Next slide, please. Um, thinking about how to put this presentation together, I wasn't sure, we weren't sure after talking with Rob how we wanted to um, go over all of the tasks that the operations team leads, which I will shorten by calling them OTLs, um, how we wanted to present it. So the best way we could come up with is just taking as if we had a new piece of checks hardware and what the operation OTL would do at that point if they had a new piece of checks hardware. So that's how the <coughs> presentation will flow. Keep in mind as I go over these tasks that these are daily, routine, constant tasks. They don't just happen one time, they're constantly done. Um, so for new checks hardware, usually that comes about because there's a medical requirement uh, that has been identified or been developed and then they decided that a new piece of hardware will help satisfy that requirement. Um, an ISS program CR or some type of other CR comes out for review to get the funding for it, then the uh, development of that hardware, they, a kickoff ha happens. Usually after that kickoff, there are design reviews. The operations team lead, OTL at that point, will attend those design reviews as we get the notification. Um, okay. That's fine. Uh, after those design reviews, uh, they attend and support from an operational capacity. Um, what can happen at those design reviews, um, as the operation team lead hears something, they can make input and say, hey, well, is there any way that you can shorten this process? Because the type of things that we look for or we listen for at those design reviews are, is this process that you're trying to get this device to do, is it going to take too much crew time? Is there a faster way to do it? Because we also try to preserve crew time in everything that we do whenever we listen to um, or support these type of boards or in anything, even with procedure development, um, which is the highlight of what we do. We try to look at that. So the next thing we do, once the kickoff ha happens and the hardware is in place and it's getting ready to get developed, um, during those phases or whatever phase the hardware development is in, you have to uh, register what, we, what they call operations nomenclature. Um, this is for ISS. Um, operations nomenclature, um, the OTL works with their ops team, which can be anyone in, that in the parentheses between engineering, crew, office, surgeon, even human factors, whoever um, is there that can provide type of input and of what they want to call an item. And that item can be as uh, big as a panel or it can be as small as a screw, um, uh, what they want to call it. So, once approval is received from the whole team together and they decide this is exactly what we want to name this, and the OTL will provide the nece necessary information to our OPNOM rep, which is Linda Neeswitch. Um, and then Linda at that point was submitted to her OPNOM advisory group and generate a CR for it, an OPNOM CR. If there are any problems or if anybody has any questions or the OPNOM suggested needs to be defended, the OTL will attend the appropriate OPNOM board and uh, defend the opnom that was suggested. The next thing we try to do is if any um, storage is ne uh, necessary, we look at the piece of hardware and what the OTL is responsible for is finding out are there kits associated with this new piece of hardware? Um, will it have an accessory kit? Will it have a maintenance kit? Will it have any type of um, thing that will require storage? 
At that point, the OTL needs to coordinate with the SA integration deputy with the storage recommendations. They are to provide all of the mentions, weight, any type of uh, storage information they can um, pass on to that person so that they can work it and make sure that we don't exceed our allocation. Because we do have what we call a checks allocation on board ISS and we have to stay within that. So we have to provide this information to the appropriate person to make sure that we're within our allocation. Um, once that is done, we work directly with if there's any other um, items that are needed, such as a CTB or a cargo transfer bag. Um, let's say we're flying, uh, they want to fly something up that doesn't have a kit but needs to be placed in something. We will work with the uh, storage representative, MOD storage representative, which is CIO or ISO, to coordinate any CD CTBs that we may need. Um, the OTL also, if this equipment, this new piece of hardware has to be plugged in somewhere on um, station. If it's not a big item like the T2, which is already pre-coordinated if it flies, but if it's a smaller portable device that can be, that needs to be, have a plug-in location, the OTL needs to pre-coordinate that and work that with the appropriate um, plug-in people, which are called Pluto, to determine any available UOP or plug-in source. We also, throughout the design review or any um, type of safety boards that this hardware goes through as it goes through its uh, nominal development phase, um, there may be hazards identified, and those hazards are usually documented in the operational control agreement database um, because we are, uh, have to track those as well. We do have an OCAD OTL, which is currently me. Uh, they send the OCADs to, of course, the, I will get that OCAD in the database, um, and I will look at the OCAD, determine if it's a CMS, HMS, EHS OCAD, and pass it on to the appropriate OTL. The OTL will then work with their ops teams, engineering, and whoever else in the community may have a, uh, whatever, whoever else needs to have a say in how we're going to implement this uh, OCAD. They work together and come up with the appropriate implementation, which is either a flight rule, procedures, or training. Give that back to me, and then I have input it into the database. Um, this is the highlight of what we do, um, and that's the next stage is beginning the procedure development process. Developing procedures, um, the OTL can do this because during, during hardware development, the engineers should work closely with the OTL, and the OTLs are usually the first ones or before training or before any other group that gets wind of what this hardware is going to do, how it's going to operate, and how it functions. So the OTL can either start developing a procedure by what they hands-on, by training like that, hands-on just being there and talking with the engineers, or from supporting documentation that usually uh, results from the hardware development process. There are certain documents that have to be produced. So the OTL can either use documentation or hands-on or work with the engineering developers directly to develop their procedures. Um, after they get a, a procedure in place or a draft form, they can send it to their checks crew representative for preview. Um, we have an assigned CB rep. Um, at this time, it's Ellen Baker, who we send our uh, checks procedures to. Um, we also have, we're responsible for scheduling, because procedure has to be validated, meaning the crew has to sign off on it, engineering has to sign off on it, and uh, obstinate lead has to sign off on it to say, yes, check, this is a good procedure. Um, because of that, the OTL is responsible for scheduling that procedure validation session. Usually, we like this session to be scheduled with the hardware so that the, um, our CB rep has an opportunity to put their hands on the hardware and go through the procedure to sign off on it. <laughs> Sometimes, if the hardware is not available and the crew rep, if they're okay with it, they will do what we call a desktop uh, procedure validation. If it's a ground procedure, because we also do ground procedures, if we have a device that has to be commanded remotely, um, if there's a ground procedure, we do that procedure as well, and then to test that procedure, we use uh, the operational readiness test as a, a way to test our procedures, which is an ORT. So you get a final, a final procedure. Um, this is just a glimpse of the procedure development process. It's usually a little bit more going back and forth than this. So it, it entitles a lot of people reviewing it. And going back and forth, you're incorporating the edits and setting up another session to go over your final product. It can go back and forth, several reiterations of that. And then when it gets to a, a, a position where we're ready to submit it for publication, we submit it. Uh, the OTL then creates a, 
SODF workflow CR. And at that point, um, because we're also a book manager, MedOps book manager, we um, go through the publication process. So after the procedure is in place and it's been ready to publish, we then start a process that um, is requirements documentation review. Again, some of these activities can happen in parallel. They don't, they're not necessarily sequenced, but I'm talking as if they are, but they're not. Um, there's a requirements documentation. We do have, um, within medical operations, we do have another group that um, is responsible for requirements and documentation. And what they do when they send out, when the IDRD for the main book comes out for whatever increment, um, they send it to our OTLs to review. Our OTLs at that point want to review this document. If they have any big ticket items or any activities that require visibility, let's say this new piece of hardware needs to be um, replace some other hardware and it needs to be during doc dops. So they're going to take this new piece of hardware, take an older, older one, remove it, and replace it with that one. It has to happen during doc dops. That's something that we try to encourage our OTLs to be cognizant of and then put into the main IDRD because that's how it's going to get done. And so we review the main IDRD. Um, we also, when we review the main IDRD, we also try to communicate whatever inputs that we have with our ISS BME increment managers, and as well as our uh, requirements documentation specialists. Um, if there are any questions about what we have submitted in the main IDRD, there we can um, defend those questions during the TCM or pass on the supporting information to our uh, requirements specialists, which is under another group within MedOps. After the main IDRD, there's another part of the requirements documentation. There's an Annex 2, which is um, the next slide. <laughs> annex 2, which is the on-orbit maintenance plan. Um, this Annex 2, we review this. We do not necessarily, we only make inputs or changes if um, something is documented incorrectly, but we are trying to, since this is a maintenance document, we try to depend on our L&M counterparts to make the initial input and we just review to make sure that everything is um, as it should be. So um, for this one, we just do a cursory review and then we, if we have any changes to it, we try to coordinate that with the l &M, uh, person to make the updates. We also do NX3, which is the, next slide, with imagery and we review this one um, just like we do the others. We make inputs um, for a new piece of hardware there's always like um, a requirement that either the engineering hardware developers or that we impose that say, hey, once this is installed, we want a picture of it to make sure that it's installed correctly. Or if, the, if um, they deploy this, we want to see how they deploy it. So that type of thing, we coordinate with our ops teams, make sure that um, we've got all of their requirements, and we make the input into the document. Um, the next annex, which is Annex 4, is actually our annex. It uh, documents any medical operations activities or requirements, and they put those in there as well. We make those inputs directly within our uh, requirements document, to our requirements documentation specialist, and um, we defend those usually at the MIT. After the post-MIT, we have a TCM where we go over any of the um, questions or changes um, with our team. This is also with surgeons, so we do our medical operations requirements with NX4. Next, usually when we have another piece of hardware um, or a new piece of hardware, if it's a big piece of hardware or if it's a, the installation of this hardware is going to um, impact any other discipline, then it usually becomes known to several groups. And we have to go and um, give them what we call an informational briefing. And usually what the OTL's role in this is that we provide the input to the presentation. So usually engineering presents it or some other discipline presents it, but we give them the format of what this um, group may want. So for instance, the requirements integration panel, we also have a rep that supports that panel um, within our group, which is Rhonda Harrelson. And if we have a presentation that um, the chair of that panel wants to see, like for instance, they may say, oh, well, what, how is this T2 is going to be installed? What maintenance is associated with T2? or how much crew time is it going to take to install. If they want all of those details, then we are requested to attend and provide that information. We send that request back to engineering, give them the information that we have, um, and help them with the presentation. 
and then they go forward and present to these different panels, whether it's the RIP uh, increment management team, the generic JOP, or the regular JOP, or, sp or flight specific JOP. And the topics can include an overview of the new hardware, um, any operational activities associated with the hardware, any maintenance requirements, time estimates, storage constraints, documentation, whatever they ask for, we try to help put that together and give that to the engineering. And we will, um, on occasion, we may present, depending on if we're asked, and we may attend. We also provide support for training. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, because we work hand in hand with the engineers on a routine basis, we are usually the first to be able to see the hardware, put our hands on the hardware, develop procedures for the hardware, et cetera. So because of that, we are sometimes tasked to look at the training plan for the hardware and say, you know, give our input. So we do that. Um, we also may assist with training, engineering um, with, and engineering with the crew and BME training. So there's a new piece of hardware that training hasn't actually been able to put their hands on. They may ask us, hey, can you do the training for us? And then we'll uh, take over after we get up to speed. So that's, we support that. We provide training on hardware to our ISO group for, since they're the storage officers and they manage the inventory management system of storage on board, a lot of our kits or whatever we fly up, they need to have a general understanding of what they're used for and, and what is a consumable and what can be trashed and things like that so they can properly track um, on-orbit inventory. We also provide, um, on our own, we provide FAM sessions uh, for big activities, major IFMs or any major activity that hasn't been done before. Uh, so we give hardware. Anybody, we try to extend our help to anyone that may need it. And that can extend to engineers, uh, MOD dis flight control disciplines, OSOs, any ACERs, any trainers, surgeons, CAPCOMs, anybody that may sit on console, know a big IFM is coming up, um, are going to help us support in some other way, also would help us with tools. Um, CAPCOM just needs to be able to uh, relay to the crew um, what uh, the procedure, so they may ask for a training session and we provide that. Um, another thing that we do, if we do, we also support the ISS BME flight controller that sits on console. Um, we do that by providing supporting documentation. That's one way we do it. Uh, one of the supporting doc pieces of documentation that we use um, or provide input to is our own Chex ha hardware catalog. Um, the Chex hardware catalog is, again, an ISS BME console resource. Um, because it is ours, we can tailor it however we see fit. So what we often do is ask the ISS BME what they would like to see in the Chex hardware catalog. But we do have a standard uh, list of information that we do provide, and that's this list here. We just try to provide a general overview of the hardware, its components, and outline the hardware's capabilities and functions. Describe the physical dimensions and limitations of the hardware, like if it has temperature constraints, pressure constraints, things like that. Explain how the hardware will interface with the vehicle. Reference how information will be transferred to the ground if, it's, uh, if we receive data from this piece of hardware. Give a timetable of resupply and um, list all hazards associated with it and any, if it has any displays that the ISS BME wants to see, we'll put those in there. Well, again, it's, it's tailored to whatever uh, the BME wants. Um, we also provide input to BME console handbook if it has anything specific to a um, function that, an act, I mean a piece of hardware of how you should need to respond to a call down or something like that, we try to provide that in the console handbook as well. We also may support, we used to, this used to be a um, required task for us, it recently changed, it's now an optional task. Um, and that is the support of hardware verification reviews and bench reviews. Um, so there are some ops team leads that, um, like for Kathy Pippling, for instance, for um, the medical accessory kit, um, when you're packing that, there's some, um, there's a reason why you may need to attend the bench review or hardware verification review if you want to photo document your hardware before it is flown and how it's packaged. Um, or record inf any information such as barcodes, serial numbers, and things like that. Or if the crew is there, because um, the crew is there, the, if they have any questions about what this kit does or what it's going to be used for. 
um, that's what we or we're now we're off, we're not doing it um, but that's what we can do or what we can provide for this activity um, there are have been occasions for like for the water kits where we have been asked to pack actually pack and label so that it's easy um, accessible by the crew and then we use those photographs if we get them and we use it as a training mechanism or we use it for as a console reference so that console knows exactly how this thing was packed so when it gets on board we can reference the crew ac accordingly. Um, we also, another big part of our job is providing the planning support. Um, Pre-increment planning, we do a lot of what we reviewed in the Annex 2 and the Annex 3 and the Annex 4 uh, or made inputs into in the Annex 4 we try to, after the increment manager has used those documents, um, BME increment manager used those documents to formulate their plan or, or what the crew should execute, we actually review that after they do it, checking to make sure that the activities line up as they should be based on those inputs into the IDRD. Um, so that is a big deal because if we, like for water activities, they have to be done on a monthly basis, so we make sure that the ISIS BME increment manager has indeed made that input that they're going to do a water collection every month. Um, storage notes, uh, we review storage notes or we provide storage notes for major IFMs and uh, storage notes are just, um, if there's a big activity like a T2 installation, where are you going to get, where does the crew need to get all of the uh, tools and things from? We provide that information for them because we are the ones that have it and track it. We verify hardware, serial number, and location. And we, we do that in conjunction with the ISO discipline as well. Uh, for real-time support, we um, do execute notes and operation notes. When the crew is on board and when they're executing our activities, what they're looking at is the input that we provided. So we tell them, OK, if you're going to do this water activity today, you need to reference this message and you need to perform these steps. And we give them the reason why in the operations notes. We also do any planning constraints um, for our console and the planners so that the planners know, uh, can I schedule the water, they, so that they know not to schedule the processing of the water before the water collects. So that type of thing we provide to them. Um, we do real-time SODFCRs as needed. There are a lot of times when um, we fly new hardware and we have, we think we have all of the nominal procedures and uh, corrective or maintenance procedures associated with that hardware. We think we have all of those in place. However, when we get up there, we realize that, hey, we need to do this maintenance activity because that's what the hardware has shown us. And we develop a new procedure and submit that as a real-time SODFCR. Uh, we uplink any supporting pro products, including documents, videos, questionnaires, anything we need to ask the crew, big picture words, daily summary words. We help with all of that as well. Um, this one is same thing as planning. We, um, we have a database that we keep all our planning in. Console support, we respond to console questions. Um, we also support on console if we have to physically be there. Like today, we had a TVIS IFM. Um, the OTL sat in the MER conference room to support that activity. We, at it, when we support an activity, we kind of consult with the engineers during that, give them suggestions. If there's a call down, give them suggestions on um, what is available on board, um, anything that we may know that may be able to help, help respond to a crew call down or anomaly. We do manifesting and consumables tracking. Anything that, like I said, any type of new hardware, any existing hardware, um, if it's as it is used, the OTL tracks its usage. As it is lost, the OTL tracks if it's lost. As it is uh, needed, the OTL tracks what's needed and makes those uh, manifesting inputs to the appropriate people. Um, manifesting, because this is just a brief, um, I won't go through all of this, but w along with manifesting, if anything, it's going up on shuttle, coming back on shuttle, or even the um, progress, sometimes on the Soyuz. If we have items like that, then we also coordinate if anything's coming down or going up. We also coordinate and provide inputs on what items, how to prepack an item, how to transfer an item, how to unstow and permanently uh, place an item on board ISS. So that is something that we work um, constantly as these flights are becoming more uh, rampant back to back, so we do that on a constant basis. 
next slide. You can probably skip the next two. Yeah, that's just what I just said, so we can skip that one too. Um, Again, part of our job is to assist with anomalies. We work with the engineers to resolve problems and generate responses. Um, that responses can be a procedure, follow-up questions, troubleshooting steps. Um, we can work with engineering. It can also mean a CHIP, which is a mission action request. Um, we work with engineering or the MERCHEX console to provide input into the CHIT. Like, what is engineering asking for? We kind of give them feedback on what's realistic, what is um, feasible from an operational perspective. So we try to give that type of guidance to the engineers. Uh, we interact with other MOD disciplines as needed. Um, we do a lot of interaction with OSO because they have tools and things that we need to uh, maintain our hardware or fix our hardware. Um, OCA, because we have a lot of data that we downlink, and so we interface a lot with them on console directly and the OTL as well. Um, again, the OTL's main job is to draft procedures. That is the bulk of the job. And so we're constantly, constantly drafting procedures. And as um, our hardware continues to evolve or change or come up with new hardware, that is something that is uh, vital so that the crew can safely operate the hardware. So we feel that procedure writing is very important. And um, we take the job very seriously. Um, so one other thing we do is we support SPRTs and FITs, um, system problem resolution team, and then the failure investigation team for our appropriate hardware. So if something breaks or if something needs to be done, uh, we support which, whatever meeting is called and so that we can respond and be there as a support. Um, we also support, I think I've already mentioned that, troubleshooting activities. Now, any questions? Good. I have, oh. one. <laughs> I have more than one, but I'll just limit it to one. So you mentioned um, that you guys really are the Larry at the front line with you know, engineering or the hardware developer, whoever that turns out to be, and the hardware sustainer, whoever that turns out to be, and whatever organization here, JSC or across the centers. And, um, and as such, you're developing the procedures and um, at some point in time, you're you're bringing in training, right? Because mm -hmm. we because ha we have the oh, yes. so you mentioned it, but I didn't I didn't understand. I guess the is there a formal handover with training, or are there some formal boundaries where you guys know this is where we training takes over versus and this is how you provide support or ver versus you know maybe at the start you're the primary and they're in a listening capacity. Well, training has to call on us. We wouldn't call on training. Training is primarily responsible for training the crew. The only way that we would get involved is this training contacted us and said, hey, because um, I, I have a firsthand experience with the TOCA because the TOCA was um, not fully built for them to get trained and up to speed on. So for the TOCA, they couldn't develop their lesson plan, which is what they used to train the crew. So they contacted our ops team lead, who was Cindy Wu, and said, hey, you've been with TOCA, or parts of it, and been able to work with it. You know how it's worked. Can you assist with the training? And the trainer still comes and still participates and still is there. It's just that they don't lead it. But we, they are the leaders in training the crew. Um, and we just assist as, you know, I hope I answered your question. Well, we review all of their lesson plans. Yeah, we review their lesson plan. Yeah, so yeah. they rely on the, a lot of the data that you have at your disposal, mm -hmm. like your, you know your procedures and your yes. input on you know uh, how it's going to be packed and how it's going to be, uh, what you're thinking the plan is for on orbit, what you're putting into your annexes and your in-flight maintenance or whatever, whatever your vision is for the hardware that you've been working with the hardware provider sustainer on, they're going to get that information from you to help yes. put it in their training program. Yes, they contact us for procedures all the time because they have to have them to train the crew right. appropriately. And they attend some, most of the same meetings that we attend when yeah. we, in regards to hardware anomalies or to new developments. And so as they, as they, um, as they're working with training, and, and I, I'm, this is a question because I don't know how this works, as they're working and they're training the crew and if the crew says, what if, you know, we could do this instead, or what if, you know, this happens or that happens, 
so if they have some lessons learned or crew questions, then does that, those lessons learned or those crew questions feed back mm -hmm. to you guys? Mm -hmm. Of and, course. And the yep. same thing with the, I know the human engineering group, the H15 does a, um, the lessons learned from the crew when they come down uh, to find out really trying to figure out how was life on orbit, what was the good, the bad, and the ugly about it. Do you guys benefit from those, mm -hmm. that, that input as well? Yeah, which is something that, now that you mentioned that, we, when they do crew debriefs, that's another yeah. part of our yeah. job as well. We do attend the crew debrief. Um, we actually help formulate some questions just to ask them, you know, how did you like this kit, or did you not like this procedure? And we try to ask questions like that. Um, along with our ops team after we coordinate and then based on the crew's response and if especially if we get the same response yeah. from different crew members we do try to make changes according to our procedure and or wherever we can make changes training. yeah or pre-flight training and one other question mm -hmm. um, you guys have been working for a long time in an, an operational program um, ISS is unique, I would say, as an operational program, although most of the folks that are probably working where you're working have grown up with this uniqueness, so we we may not think of it as unique, but, it, uh, you know, I've heard, heard it described that you move in the house while the house is still being built. So it is a mixed <laughs> bag of not only true ops, but also maintenance uh, and new hardware development all in one. It, you, it's a lot, a lot of cha changes going on constantly since it's, it's still in constru under construction, so to speak. Um, my question is that that unique environment has given you guys a lot of insight into things that, ooh, if we could just could have pre-planned this or if we just could have considered this early on, it would have been great. It would have saved this or it would have made everybody's job easier. It could have potentially saved the money. It could have saved crew time. It could have saved on orbit maintenance, resupply, whatever. You know, the, the list is endless. Do you guys, because you're so busy with your down and in, you are so busy, um, do you have a way, do you have a representative on your team or a way to inform future programs, you know, so that you can say, so that you can not sit in on every meeting, but if there are key things that you could listen in on and say, well, you know, here's my two cents on that. Uh, just from experience, maybe it doesn't apply in the scope or the mission of the, you know, this this new program. But do you have any way to do that? Because I know you're probably so overburdened with what you're doing that you're just barely probably getting your current jobs done. We've, for Are there been a any formal way, that? no. But I know that we've had an opportunity with, um, for for example, with the existing radiation hardware that is currently on board. We've, we've seen things with that. We've got experience with that. We've learned that. We, we document those type of things. And I know that for the new radiation hardware that they're proposing, if everything goes as planned, that um, the ops team lead for that, Will Mysick, and some of the ISSBMEs have been invited to these, what I call design reviews, and then they voice those type of concerns there to say, hey, we've noticed with this hardware that we currently have that we're taking so much time doing this it, we have a faster way or we have a proposal can you get this done and like this so this minimize the amount of time that we spend commanding your radiation device getting the get our radiation device getting the uh, data down why can't we just do it in one command boom get the data down so we we have opportunities at, as new hardware comes about in design reviews to provide that operational experience input um, but as far as a yeah, I'm thinking a bigger picture. Yeah, bigger picture. I don't mission driving, system well, driving. You know, oh. take for example with Constellation. We do, we have been um, converting uh, individuals who have served as ISS BMEs to these oh, Constellation yeah. tasks, so they can carry those lessons learned forward um, with the development of any new vehicles. So we do try to to sit on those teams and provide feedback for them about what worked well and what didn't work well uh, for ISS. Okay. Yeah, maybe that was a question for Rob. Yeah, I think that's key. Yeah. Well, um, are there any other questions? Uh, I'd like to thank Veronica and oh. Rob. Oh, would you? you have no, one? go ahead. That's okay. Oh, well, um, my interest is operational because uh, I used to be a BME back in the early '80s and oh. before you guys were born, I think. But oh. uh, uh, I was, <laughs> I was back then. Too. <laughs> <laughs> I think.
think we had uh, four or five DMEs at most, but we only work shuttle. How, how do you balance, you've got OTLs, they don't, my impression is they don't necessarily work console on a regular basis, but you have another group that does the 24-7 ops, right? Yes. How, how big is that group? 18. 18? And the ops, ops team leads are, are nine, so or 10 plus her, so that's 28 people to support ISS operations. And do you, what kind of shift work do you actually do as far as uh, Eight on, sixteen off, or do you rotate shifts? Do you do twelve on, twelve off? It's all nine-hour shifts, and they're on their rotating basis. So if you serve, if you work a day shift, you maybe work in the office the next week, then you go work the afternoon shift, work in the office the next week, and then you work the graveyard. So it's kind, of, it always rotates forward. Okay. <laughs> so I'd, li I'd like to thank. Uh, Rob and Veronica for coming today. Um, really appreciate this level of insight. And uh, again, my name is Debbie Burdich. And so if you have any questions, if you're here in the audience or if you're listening online, if you have any questions at all, uh, please feel free to contact me and uh, we can get you some information. And I know Rob and Veronica, I'm sure, would be happy to. Uh, uh, I'll get it in a minute. <laughs> We'd be happy to answer questions as well. So thank you very much for attending tonight.